Good morning, and thank you very much for joining us here in the building, but also to all those who are joining us online. It's great to have you here as we begin this four-week series uh, called Warning Signs. We're going to take a look at this Old Testament prophet, Amos, and the book that we have called Amos in the Bible. Amos was one of the Old Testament prophets. In our Bible, we have 17 books of the prophets. These books of the prophets are divided into the former prophets, Joshua, Judges, Samuel and Kings, and the later prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12 or minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. And that is a good list. And those of you who've read some or all of these books know that these prophets can come across as a fairly intense group of individuals. They can seem to be full-on angry, cranky, even a bit over the top. Let me give you some examples. Amos says this in his book, Hear this word, you cows of Basham, who oppress the poor and crush the needy. Isaiah says, Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. I cannot bear your evil assemblies. And Amos again, now then, I will crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. There are many examples in the books of the prophets and they claim that they spoke on God's behalf. So it's important to ask the question when we're having a read of the prophets, What do we make of God? What do we make of God if these are his words? And these men were called by him to speak to the people of that day. But not only do the words of the prophets sometimes sound really harsh, angry, but prophets also resort to behaviour that often just looks really, really bizarre. They did this to provide object lessons to shake people into paying attention, to kind of make people uh, wake them up. And so we have Hosea marrying a prostitute to show how unfaithful the Israelites had become. Ezekiel eats food cooked over excrement to show how defiled God's people have become. Jeremiah digs up a filthy, buried, unwashed undergarment to show the people how God finds their behaviour grossly offensive. The books of the prophets are filled with stuff like this, and often reading the prophets is not a joyful experience. A couple of weeks ago, Emily Gash arrived here at church after listening to Amos in her car, and in her very calm, quiet, measured manner, she came up to me and said, who picked Amos for a series? Whoa, he is full on. He's cursing this group and then he curses that one and then he finds another group to curse. This is not a happy book. So who picked it? And I had to own up at that point and say, Brendan. Um, (laughs) But she's right. Amos is not a happy book. And let's face it, we like happy books. So let's have another look at Philippians or Ephesians, something New Testament, something with less burning whole towns down. So why should we read the prophets? Well, for one thing, we should do it because they're in the Bible. Secondly, you need to think long term. When you get to heaven and you're having coffee with a few friends and this bloke joins your group, And he's introduced to you as Amos, the Amos. And you begin to chat with him. And then he asks, so how'd you like my book? (laughs) It'll be a bit awkward if you say, well, I, I meant to. But you know life's busy. Or you say to him, well, I started listening to it. But whoa, mate, those first two chapters, that was all too a bit intense. It's going to be pretty awkward for you. So save yourself some future awkwardness, read the prophets, and start with reading the book of Amos. I want to be up front. One of our hopes, one of our real prayer points 
Uh, when we were talking about what we hope to see happen as a result of looking at this book of Amos, is we want to encourage you to read the book of Amos a couple of times over the next couple of weeks. The whole nine chapters, get into the book of Amos. Ask your questions, write down your comments, begin to ask God to show you things, to remind you of things, to speak to you through this prophet. But I want to say a a bit more motivation to read the prophets is for you to grasp that there has to be a reason. There has to be a good reason why God chose 17 books of the Bible to be the books of the prophets. And there must be a reason for the anger of the prophets. There must be a reason for the anger of the prophets. I love this quote that's going to come up on the screen. C.S. Lewis said these words, Anger is the fluid that love bleeds when it's cut. Anger is the fluid that love bleeds when it gets cut. Maybe the anger of the prophets is not a lack of self-control or a symptom of a cranky disposition. And maybe there is a reason why we, more than almost any Christians in any other era, need to hear the words of the prophets and heed the warnings. I want you to understand that the band of 12 minor prophets were called prophets not because they predicted the future, Although they did that, and the accuracy with which they did ought to strengthen our faith. They were called prophets because they spoke the word of God. They were God's mouthpiece. And rather than constantly predicting future events like some heavenly horoscope, the prophet's primary function was to call God's people back to him. The primary function of the prophets was to call people back to him. Their messages were God's word to God's people. And it had to do with those peoples here and now. And I want to say to you that the messages that are in the prophets still have something to say to our here and now. John Ortberg states this, We can be tempted to read the prophets and think, What's the big deal? Why are they so heated up? Society is not so bad. Things are generally going okay for me right now. I know there's violence in the world and and it's regrettable. But as long as it doesn't touch my life, I'd prefer not to think about it. Certainly the violence couldn't be connected to my anger, my hostility, my indifference, My lack of love. Cheating is another example. I know it's not ideal, but it goes on everywhere. And it's prevalent in the business community. So if I'm going to be in that community, well, I've got to do those things. Cut corners. The same goes for poverty and disease. Sad. But that stuff is a long way away. According to the Smith family, it isn't. Here in this nation, approximately 1.2 million Australian children and young people are growing up in poverty. That equates to one in six children in Australia. These children generally have poorer educational outcomes than their more advantaged children. Students who live in poverty also experience more social exclusion at school than their more advantaged peers. And research suggests disadvantage at home carries over into disadvantage at school and disadvantage in other social and recreational settings. Child poverty in Australia has remained stubbornly high since the early 2000s. In 1987, some of you can remember, Prime Minister Bob Hawke famously pledged to end child poverty by 1990. And as a result of his government's actions, child poverty initially declined, but then it began increasing again. And child poverty rates are now only slightly lower than in 1999. In that time, child poverty 
has been largely absent from any government's policy agendas. Let me say that again. In that time, child poverty has been largely absent from any government's policy agendas. And every week in this place, in this church, we see them. Every week in this place, in this church, we see them. Some are here this morning. They get picked up. And sometimes they arrive here at our programs and they arrive last Sunday with no shoes because their one pair of shoes is wet. Or they arrive here without a jumper because that jumper that they have is looking a bit worn and it doesn't fit anymore. And every week, this church, you, because of your giving, takes care of some kids who are homeless. Those kids don't sleep on the streets, but because of various circumstances, they don't have a home. They are with their mums, and I could say a whole lot about that because their dads aren't around. But they're with their mums, and they stay with different relatives, and they move around. And every morning... Because of this church, Emma Burstow, who works part-time in the youth area, picks up children to get them to school. And the evening prior, she just checks where they'll be. And that morning she drives wherever they'll be and she makes sure they get to school so they don't get left behind and they don't get left out. This morning, after church is finished, there's going to be a party. It's going to be in the northern loft. It's for a little girl who's homeless. Again, she doesn't sleep on the streets, but she's with her mum who battles and battles and battles and life has been really difficult for this lady. And this little girl who's having a party's turned nine on Wednesday. She has cerebral palsy. So one arm doesn't quite work the way the other one does. And one leg doesn't quite operate. But she's here every week. She plays in the footy team that I coach. She is the master of the one-armed mark. She can mark one arm. Her kicking is still a bit wild, but we're getting there. But she's here this morning. She's here this morning. Her mum is sitting in this room with us right now. And there's a whole lot of teenagers from the youth group who are going to throw her a party at the end of this service. They were here on Friday afternoon. And let me just give you the picture. These are some of the... They're teenagers. You get them. Um, They're sometimes a bit too cool for school. But on Friday afternoon, they were sitting on the floor wrapping past the parcel wraps. They were getting ready for all of these little games. They were blowing up balloons to make sure that this little one celebrates her birthday. And it's possible because of you. But I want to say to you that it is really easy to think that they're not my children. Maybe their parents did something to deserve it. Or maybe to think there's nothing I can do about it. And these prophets, when you read them, act like the world is falling apart if someone ignores the poor or just bends the truth a bit. They fall apart, it seems, if someone takes advantage of someone because they're an easy mark. Jesus was considered by many in his day to be a prophet. Many of us believe him to be far more than that. But it seems that he caught some of the extremism of the Old Testament prophets. For it was he who insisted that every time someone is in prison and doesn't get visited, every time someone's hungry and doesn't get fed, every time someone's naked and doesn't get clothed, he's the one who suffers. So why did all these prophets get all wound up? What was the big deal for them? 
The big deal in John Ortberg's words are these. The prophets were given a heavy burden of looking at our world and seeing what God sees and knowing what God knows and feeling what God feels, and it crushed them. They saw what God sees. They, they had a sense of what he knew, and they felt what he feels, and it crushed them. They saw rich people trying to get richer, looking the other way while poor people died. We, don't, we really don't want to know the truth about what sin, our sin, has done in our lives and to our world. Abraham Helschel is a scholar of the Old Testament prophets. He says this, the shallowness of our moral comprehension the incapacity to sense the depth of misery caused by our own failures is a simple fact of fallen humanity which no explanation can justify or hide. The events that horrified and appalled and broke and crushed the prophets are everyday occurrences in our world. Herschel also said this, the prophet is a man who feels fiercely. God has thrust a burden upon his soul and he is bowed and stunned by man's fierce greed. Prophecy is the voice God has lent to the silent agony. Prophecy is the voice that God has lent to the silent agony and God is raging in the prophet's words. So let's for a little while talk about this prophet Amos and his book, which we have available to us in our Bibles. Amos was not a professional prophet who earned his living from his ministry. Amos stood outside religious institutions. Chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 7, verse 14, tell us that Amos was a shepherd and a cultivator of sycamore trees when God called him to speak on his behalf. I love the fact that Amos in describing himself in verse 1 simply refers to himself as one of the shepherds of Tekoa. He simply says, I'm one of the shepherds. Tekoa was a small village, a rural village, about 16 kilometres from Jerusalem. And according to the first verse of Amos, he prophesied during the reigns of Uzziah, over Judea, which was between 792 BC and 740 BC, and Jeroboam II over Israel, when he ruled Israel, between 793 BC and 753 BC. And though Amos's home was in Judea, he was sent to announce God's judgment on the northern kingdom, Israel. He probably ministered for the most part at Bethel, Bethel was Israel's main religious sanctuary, where the upper echelons of the northern kingdom worshipped. The name Amos is derived from the Hebrew word Amos, and it means to load or to carry a burden. In some of the study Bibles, it actually gives Amos, the name Amos, the meaning burden bearer. The main part of Amos's ministry was probably carried out around 760 BC to 750 BC, a period of about 10 years. That was his main time of ministry. For the rest of the time, the rest of his life, he was a shepherd and he tended the sycamore trees. But that time of his ministry, you need to understand that both Judah and Israel were enjoying prosperity and security. Luxury abounded and religion was popular. Israel flocked to the royal chapel at Bethel and Judah celebrated the feast enthusiastically. But the sins of both nations were eroding their religious and moral fibre of the people. The rich exploited the poor. The judicial system was corrupt and injustice flourished everywhere. One commentator described Israel at that time as being politically secure and spiritually smug. They were secure. They were enjoying great prosperity and peace. 
that that had led them to becoming spiritually smug. I want to say to you, and I want to say this really strongly, the focus of the book of Amos is Yahweh. The focus of the book of Amos is on God. And if you miss that, you miss what this book is all about. The name Yahweh appears by itself or in combination with other names over 80 times in those nine chapters of the book. Amos is not just wanting to bring warnings to people. He's wanting us to know God better. He's wanting us to look again at God and to try to figure out who is this God? What is he about? Amos portrays God as sovereign over the nations. He portrays God as sovereign over history. He is the creator of the earth and the heavens. There is a strong emphasis in Amos on divine speech. God's voice is described as being like thunder in verse 2 of chapter 1. And throughout Amos, you will see these words. This is what the Lord says and declares the Lord. These verses, these phrases permeate the book. And God's oath-taking underscores the seriousness of this message. So for a few minutes, let's have a bit of a look at Amos 1 and 2 with some commentary. So this is Amos chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, the vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Uzziah was king of Israel, or Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Joash, the king of Israel. And Amos says this, The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. And before we move on, understand that this is a thematic verse. This is, ominous, this is announcing the main thrust of Amos' message. God is going to roar. Amos was a shepherd. He was sent to Israel to warn them that he'd heard a lion's roar. And that lion is none other than God himself, who had only ever wanted to be Israel's shepherd. This sets the tone for the whole book. God is about to roar. And the word used for roar, the word that is used in this passage, denotes a lion's roar as he pounces upon his prey. It would indicate God's wrath and the fact that his righteous judgment was coming quickly. And this is combined with the roar of the storm, especially in view of the parallel use of the expression thunders, which does not indicate an articulate word of God, but rather an awesome noise, such as the roar of thunder. Whatever was coming next, whatever was coming next was not going to be nice or light or happy. This is a God who should not be trifled with or treated with disdain. Because this is a God who can roar. Amos continues. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of, the, of Carmel withers. And he's basically saying that God is going to decimate and dry up all the pastures of Israel. God will roar. The roar comes from Zion. That is Jerusalem the divine residence and place of God's authority, and it just withers the pasture lands of Israel. And then Amos moves on to the burning down parts, and we move to a section which is God's judgment on Israel's neighbours. And this is what the Lord says, Amos says. For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent. Now, we need to understand that that particular statement, for three sins, even for four, was a Hebrew idiom. An idiom is a group of words established by usage as having a meaning that cannot be deduced from just looking at the individual words. So we understand what I mean when we say that person was over the moon. We know that that means that they're so happy. It's a big deal. 
That, that's an idiom. If you have a look at the words individually, you don't understand what that statement is saying or that phrase is saying. When Amos said, for three sins or even four, what he was meaning was this, an indefinite number that has finally come to an end. The idiom means an indefinite number that has come to an end. It was used in connection usually with a great number that was difficult to count. But the key thing is it's reached its end. The phrase, I will not relent, can also be translated, I will not put up with this anymore. When God is saying, I will not relent, tied to that phrase, it can be translated, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. For the three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent, because she threshed Gilead and slept with sledges having iron teeth. I will send fire on the house of Hazel that will consume the fortresses of Ben-Hadid. I will break down the gate of Damascus. I will destroy the king who's in the, vil- the valley of Arven and the one who holds the scepter in Beth Eden. The, pe- the people of Arman will go into exile to Kerr, says the Lord. Amos passed God's judgment on Damascus, which was the capital of Syria, one of Israel- Israel's persistent em- enemies. Amos denounced the Syrians for their inhumane inhumane treatment of the Israelites who lived in Gilead, east of the Jordan River. The Syrians had been cruel in the way they had threshed the people, as though the people were nothing but stalks of grain. But that was coming to an end. And then Amos continues in verse 6. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not relent. Because she took took captive whole communities and sold them to Adam. I will send fire on the walls of Gaza uh, and consume her fortresses. I will destroy the king of Asher and the one who holds the scepter in Ashkeon. I will turn my hands against Thekon till the last of the Philistines are dead says the Sovereign Lord. Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkeon, Gath and Erkon were five key Philistine cities. And Amos denounced all of them for trading in human lives. The history of that time was that they would often raid Hebrew villages. They would capture slaves and then sell them. Amos gives God's judgment. Amos goes through this deal six more times, each time beginning with the statement, for three sins, even for four, I will not relent. He sets his sights straight north and on the major city of Tyre. Tyre had committed the same sins as the Philistine cities by selling Hebrew captives. And Amos declared that God would send his fire on Tyre. In the next verses that follow that, Amos condemned the Edomites for their persistent hatred of the Israelites. That hatred would receive a just punishment from God. And again, he declares that God will set fire to the walls of their cities and consume their fortresses. At the start of chapter 2, it was the turn of the Moabites. Now, I'm sure as that was progressing... His fellow Israelites were standing listening to Amos' statements about those other nations, their neighbouring nations, and they were probably impressed, even applauding, and they wanted to hear more. In their minds, in the minds of the people of Israel and Judea, this was exactly what those neighbouring nations deserved. But the atmosphere quickly changed as Amos in chapter 2 turns his attention on Judea, his own land, And then, boy, does he go into some detail on Israel. And the very idea of a Hebrew prophet classifying God's chosen people in the same category with outsiders, with Gentiles, would have almost been too much for his listeners. How dare he? Doesn't he know that we've been given a special relationship with God? Doesn't he know that? 
But Amos unloads on Judah for turning away from God and embracing other gods. But then comes Israel's turn, and it's quite a turn. Amos does not hold back, and he goes into far greater detail about their sins. Let's have a bit of a look. He names three fragrant. He names three sins. To begin with, the people of the northern kingdom, Israel, were guilty of injustice. He says this, For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They sell, this is the people of Israel, they sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. What was happening in that time was that the rich were exploiting the poor. And at times they would actually, through the corrupt courts, have these people who couldn't repay the debts sold into servanthood. The people of Israel were doing it to their own people. And he says they sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Sometimes all these people owed these rich people was the cost of a pair of sandals and they were being sold into servitude. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and they deny justice. They deny justice to the oppressed. Supported by corrupt judges, the rich were suing the poor who couldn't pay their bills and they were forced into slavery. The second sin that Amos declares is found in Amos 2, verse 7b. And it simply says this, it is the sin of immorality, but it is gross immorality. Amos says this, father and son use the same girl and so profane my name. The example he gives is fathers and sons visiting the same prostitute. These may have been prostitutes who were part of the idolatrous worship. And thus a double sin was involved, immorality and idolatry. Or the girl may have been a household servant or a common prostitute. But this was offensive, deeply offensive to God, who had put up with all sorts of things for so long. In chapter 2, verse 8, and again we're talking about the people of Israel, the third sin was open idolatry. They lie down beside every altar. On garments taken in pledge, in the house of their gods, they drink wine taken as, fi as fines. Wealthy men took their debt, the, the people who owed the money, took their garments as pledges. But they did not return them as, at sundown as the law commanded. They held on to those garments. And instead, these rich sinners visited pagan altars where they got drunk on wine purchased with the fines they had exacted from the poor. And then in their drunken stupor, they slept by the altars on other people's garments, defiling the garments and disobeying the law. Amos then goes on to remind the people of Israel of their glorious past. God had led them, his people out of Egypt had cared for them in the wilderness, had destroyed other nations so the Israelites could claim their inheritance. He had given them his word through chosen prophets and he had raised up dedicated people like Nazarites to be examples of devotion to God. What a glorious past that had. But instead of being humble, instead of being grateful for those blessings, the people rebelled against God by rejecting the messages that God sent over and over again to call his people back to him. Amos closes his message in chapter 2 with an announcement of, it, of Israel's terrible future. He simply says Israel would be crushed by their own sins, just as a loaded cart crushes whatever it rolls over. Judgment was coming and nobody would be able to escape. The swift wouldn't be able to run away. The strong wouldn't be able to defend themselves. The armed would be as if un unarmed. Even horsemen would be unable to flee. Told you it's not a happy book. 
So if the main focus of Amos is God, what does what we read in Amos, what does what we know about Amos, and what do we figure about what he speaks about, what does it say about God? What do you make of God? Can I just suggest a few things for you to think on this week, to reflect on? Amos declared that God was going to judge his unfaithful, disobedient, covenant-breaking people. Despite the Lord's special choice of Israel and his kindness to them during the exodus, the conquest, and in the days of David and Solomon, his people continually failed to obey and honour God. And I say this carefully, but I want you to hear it. And there was a limit. There was a limit. There was a point when God said, that's enough. God says, I will choose not to put up with this anymore. And the consequences are severe and serious. His people had continued to take his mercy and his loving kindness for granted. They had abused his goodness and it wasn't that God couldn't keep putting up with it but rather that God realised that his people had gone down this path so many times now that their hearts were hardened and their hearts were so hard that they were no longer sensitive to the warnings that he had given over and over and over again. They no longer wanted God as their God. Some of them thought they did, but they wanted God on their terms. God, I believe, always goes to extraordinary lengths to protect us, to save us, to work for our good. However, the more often we choose to ignore him, dismiss him, disobey him, we will dull ourselves to his voice. We will dull and harden our hearts To choose to treat God as anything less than God is always a dangerous option because of the effect it has on us. Because of what happens to us when we continually disobey and ignore and treat God as though he is far less. Secondly, as God's chosen people, Israel's behavior should have shown the world something of God's own character. But Amos makes clear that this was not happening. What was happening was just the opposite. God's name and his reputation was being harmed by the actions and attitude of these people who claimed that they had a special relationship with him. And he would not allow that to continue indefinitely. Thirdly, anyone who reads the whole book of Amos cannot escape Amos's call for social justice as an indispensable expression of true devotion to God. Anyone who reads the whole book of Amos cannot escape God's call, God's call for social justice as an indispensable expression of true devotion to God. God is a God who elects and expects. Amos is clear that the love of God cannot be divorced from love of neighbour. He rebukes those who are apparently pious in their religious observance. One day, they attend, they attend the temple. They offer sacrifices. They go to the festivals. But the very next day, they return to exploiting the needy. Amos expects that the totality of their lives of God's chosen people should be lived in accordance with God's will. And without a commitment to justice, religious observances were nothing more than empty rituals and they were abominable to God. We live in a world where injustice, large and small, goes on every day. So do justice. Be an agent for justice. I can't correct all the injustices in the world, but I can do something. I can notice, I can read, I can study, I can write letters, 
I can be thoughtful about what's going on in the world. I can pay attention to which governments and companies are being just and which are not. I can pray. I can ask God to help me treat others fairly. I can at least have the courage to stand up for people who are getting treated unfairly in my little world, in my school, in my office, in my neighbourhood, in my home. I who have... I who have so much more than I need, so much more than I deserve, I can give some of what I have to others who have no food or no home or no hope. You know, you know what the Lord requires of you. My hope is that over the next four weeks, I would hope that you'll read Amos. Read it with an openness and a willingness to just ask God to speak to you about the here and now. Look for God. If Amos, over the years, I think people have looked at Amos being all about the warnings and all about the judgments and all about the burning down places. Amos is a book about God. And Amos wants us to understand certain things about God. So my prayer for you is that as you read, God will speak. As you get into this book, you'll begin to speak to each other about what you're hearing and what you're reading and what God is saying to you. I am very thankful that this church does things like throws parties for little girls who are homeless. I'm so proud of this church because you make it possible for kids to get to school because we understand that if they keep missing school, they just keep falling further and further behind. I'm so thankful that on Tuesday afternoon, there are lots of volunteers, you, who sit with kids, go over stuff. Sometimes you learn more than they do, but you're there with them. And that says something, and it says something about God. So as we finish... We're going to have a seven-minute summary of the book of Amos. By the time you walk out of here, you are, you are going to be experts on Amos. Would you just watch this summary of the book of Amos? The book of the prophet Amos. Amos was a shepherd and a fig tree farmer who lived right near the border between northern Israel and southern Judah. Now, the north had seized its independence about 150 years earlier. Remember 1 Kings chapter 12? And it was currently being ruled by Jeroboam II, a successful military leader. He won lots of battles and new territory for Israel, and he generated lots of wealth. But in the eyes of the prophets, he was one of the worst kings ever. His wealth had led to apathy, and he allowed idol worship for the gods of Canaan, which in turn led to injustice and the neglect of the poor. And it got to the point where Amos could couldn't take it anymore. He sensed God calling him to go trek up north to Bethel, an important city that had a large temple, and start announcing God's word to the people. And this book is a collection of his sermons and poems and visions uttered over the years. They were compiled later to give God's people a sense of his divine message to the northern kingdom. And it's a message we still need to hear today. The book has a fairly clear design. Chapters 1 and 2 are a series of messages to the nations and Israel. Then chapters 3 to 6 are a collection of poems that express Amos' message to the people of Israel and its leaders. Chapters 7 through 9 contain a series of visions that Amos experienced that depict God's coming judgment on Israel. Let's just dive in. So the book opens with a series of short poems that accuse all of Israel's neighbors of violence and injustice. And this is kind of odd because the book's opening line said that Amos was going to speak against Israel. But watch how this works. As Amos is naming all of these neighboring nations, you can go look at a map and see that he's creating a circle. And when he's done, Israel lies right in the center, like a target in the crosshairs. And on Israel, Amos unleashes a poetic accusation that's three times longer and more intense than any of these others. He accuses Israel's wealthy of ignoring the poor and allowing grave injustice in their land, specifically by allowing the poor to be sold into debt slavery, and then going on to deny any of these people legal representation. And this 
Amos asks, is this the family that was once denied justice and enslaved in Egypt? The family that God rescued from oppression and slavery? The party's over, Amos says. God is done putting up with you. And so the opening of the next section explains why. God says, I chose you, Israel, from among all the families of the earth. This is an allusion to Genesis 12, how God had called the family of Abraham to become God's blessing to all of the nations. And so then God says, so this is why I will punish you for all of your sin. Israel had a great calling, which came with great responsibility. And so their sin and rebellion brings great consequences. Now, this section brings together a lot of Amos's poems, and you'll see a few key themes repeated over and over. So first, he's constantly exposing the religious hypocrisy of Israel's wealthy and their leaders. And he describes how they faithfully attend the religious gatherings, giving offerings and sacrifices, all the while neglecting the poor and ignoring injustice. And Amos says it's all a sham, that God actually hates their worship because it's totally disconnected from how they treat people. God says a real relationship with him will transform a person's relationships. And so Amos is called to true worship is to let justice flow like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. Now, these two words, they're super important for Amos and actually all of the prophets. So righteousness, or in Hebrew, tzedakah, refers to a standard of right, equitable relationships between people, no matter their social differences. And justice, or in Hebrew, mishpat, refers to concrete actions that you take to correct injustice and create righteousness. And so both of these are to permeate the life of God's covenant people like a rushing stream fills a dry riverbed. The next theme is Amos's repeated accusations of Israel's idolatry. So remember, when the northern kingdom broke away from southern Judah, their king built two new temples to rival Solomon's in Jerusalem, and he placed a golden calf in each. Remember 1 Kings chapter 12. Since then, Israel had only accumulated more idols, worshiping the gods of sex and weather and war. And in the prophet's view, the worship of these gods always led to injustice because these gods don't require the same degree of justice and righteousness as the God of Israel, not to mention that these gods were immoral themselves, not the God of Israel. He's different. So he can say in one place, seek me that you may live. And then right after that, say to Israel, seek good, not evil that you may live. So true worship of the creator God of Israel, it's synonymous with doing good, with generosity and with justice. And so the final theme in these chapters is that because Israel and its king have rejected Amos and the other prophets, God will send the day of the Lord. This is a great and terrible act of justice on Israel. And specifically, Amos predicts that a powerful nation will come and conquer and decimate their cities and take the people away into exile. And we know his prediction came true. Some 40 years later, the Assyrian Empire swooped in and did exactly as Amos had said. The book closes with a series of visions that Amos experienced and their symbolic depictions of the coming day of the Lord. So he sees Israel devastated by a locust swarm and then by a scorching fire, and then they're being swallowed up like overripe fruit. And in the final vision, Amos sees God violently striking the pillars of Israel's great idol temple at Bethel, and the whole building comes crumbling down. It's an image of God's justice on the leaders and the gods of Israel. Their end has finally come. But then, all of a sudden, in the final paragraph, we see a glimmer of hope. It picks up this image of Israel as a destroyed building, and God says that out of the ruins, he will one day restore the house of David. In other words, he's going to bring the future messianic king from David's line, and he will rebuild the family of God's people, which, surprisingly, we're told, is going to include people from all of the nations. All of the devastation caused by Israel's sin and God's judgment will that day be reversed. Now, this final paragraph is super important. It's the only sign of hope on the other side of judgment. And it helps us see how this book is exploring the relationship between God's justice and his mercy. If God is good, he has to confront and judge evil among Israel and the nations. But his long-term purposes are to restore his world and build a new covenant family. And so through Amos's words, we still today hear his call to learn from Israel's hypocrisy and disaster and to embrace a true worship of this God, which should always lead to justice and righteousness and loving our neighbor. And that's what the book of Amos is all about. Thank you.